Hello, I'm Tony Terzillo. I'm a solutions engineer with VMware, and today I'm going to give you a demo of how the VMware Advanced Load Balancer works. I have over 20 years of experience with various load balancing products, and I'm really excited to show you how this one works. In a traditional load balancing approach, the control plane and the data plane are tightly coupled. So an individual load balancer contains all of its configuration all the information it needs to do its job. However, in a modern distributed architecture, like the one used by the Avi controller for the VMware Advanced Load Balancer, the control plane and the data plane are separate. So I can distribute my data plane with what are called service engines. These are the individual load balancers, and these load balancers can live in various locations. They can live in the public cloud, they can live in a private cloud infrastructure, uh, they can live in containers. So we get this software load balancing, intelligent web application firewalling, and container ingress, all managed by the Avi controller. So we have a single software-defined point of control versus hundreds of load balancer pairs. We have an elastic fabric with on-demand capacity that allows us to scale up and down as needed and we can deploy this in multi-cloud infrastructures. On top of that, we get real-time analytics and very rich logging and fast troubleshooting. I'm going to show you all of that in my demo. I wanted to show you the VMware portal where you can download the Avi software. So this Avi software does not require any VMware components, but you can deploy it on a VMware ESX infrastructure. It can also de be deployed in bare metal environments, in a container cloud. It can be deployed as a Docker image, it can be deployed within OpenStack and KVM, it can be deployed in various public cloud environments. So this is where you would actually download that software to deploy it. So the controller is the central brain that spans data centers and clouds. If you're going to be doing load balancing in Google Cloud or AWS, this does not mean that you have to de deploy your controller in Google Cloud. You can. You could also deploy it in your private infrastructure and then use it to deploy load balancing endpoints, which we call service engines, within those cloud environments. So it doesn't require NSX. It doesn't require any VMware ESX products, but we integrate well with those products if you choose to use them. Now, as I log into the Avi Vantage portal, one thing you'll notice that I didn't have to type any credentials. I'm using Workspace ONE. And as I said, the advanced load balancer doesn't require any other VMware products to work, but it integrates well with them. So since we're integrated with Workspace ONE, we get dropped into the admin tenant because we're logging in as the admin user. I'm going to switch over to the demo tenant. So the great thing about our multi-tenancy solution is that when you switch to a particular tenant, you see the virtual services that are associated with that tenant and nothing more. Now, I have virtual servers that are in various cloud environments. And if we go ahead and click on the infrastructure and look at the clouds, I can see that I have connections to AWS, Azure Cloud, and VMware Cloud. Now, if I want to deploy any services within any of those infrastructures, when I create a VIP, I can specify which cloud I want it to go into, and I get full visibility into the resources that are available to me within that cloud. Now, I'll switch to the App Tree view. So if I want to look at what's going on with a particular virtual server, I get a nice tree that shows me all of the different pools that are associated with the virtual server. So this is something that's unique to our product as well. Uh, with other load balancers, you might require specialized programming to have multiple pools selected. But we can associate multiple pools with the virtual server. And then we can see right here, the health and status of all those pool members. If we want to drill down and see why a particular uh, thing is down, we can do that. 
Um, we also do some anomaly-based detection where we can look at if the virtual server isn't getting any traffic. So we had one customer that saw this, they saw the anomaly and they realized that they had a firewall blocking the traffic. So right away, we can give you really great information about the health and status of your application. If we wanna see what's going on with a virtual server, we can just click on it and this will give us access to real-time analytics. Now, one thing I'll point out is that we have a historical view here so we can see what's been happening from a network perspective. So we can look at the traditional things like throughput, open connections, number of requests per second. Um, but the other thing we get is visibility into our client round trip times, server round trip times, and our app response. Now, if somebody tells me that at 12 p.m., users started having slowdowns, and I look at the normal network stats here, the green, everything looks good. Now, if I change to view the user experience, I can see that between 12 p.m. and 1 p.m., something was going on with the application. The app response time shows me that it went over 75 millisecond response times. So I've spent a lot of time in war rooms trying to troubleshoot issues like this. And we'd start collecting TCP dumps on the load balancers. Sometimes we didn't even know which load balancer the traffic went through. So we'd have to do TCP dumps on multiple systems. And after staring at the TCP dumps, we might isolate the problem. Now the problem is with this issue, if I start troubleshooting this at 4 p.m., the event's already passed and I'm not going to be able to figure it out. If I go back and look at the green part here, which is the kind of information that I would get from most systems, everything looks fine. So how do we get to that mean time to innocence where we can help reduce the amount of time spent in a war room troubleshooting? That's where these analytics and our logs come in. So if we go here and look at the logs, we can start troubleshooting this issue. So if I just click on one of these, I get some very interesting information. So I see the client IP, I see where it came from, I see what browser they were using, I see the SSL version that they used, I get to see which VIP they connected to, I can see what their request ID is. I can see which service engine it went through. So which particular load balancer was servicing the, uh, the request. And then I can go and look at all of the headers as well. So if I look at the headers, I can see which headers were sent to the server, what was sent to the client. I don't have to create TCP dumps where I need to to filter on this particular client IP and then try and figure out which ones went to the server and which ones went to the client. This is all right here. So this saves a ton of time right here, just that aspect. Now everything in here is clickable. So if I wanted to create a filter that says, show me anything from Windows 8.1, I could do that. And this is, this is all of the uh, traffic coming from Windows machines. But let's go back to the issue of app response time. So let me take a look when the app response time is greater than a certain amount of time. So if I wanna see greater than 100 milliseconds, for example. Okay, so now I get a view of all the times when I was seeing poor performance and my response time was greater than 100 milliseconds. So I'm gonna narrow this down to the particular time frame that we're interested in, which is from 12 to one. And that will only show me the logs for that time period. Now, when I come over here on this side, I can do other filters and I can start looking at more information 
Uh, for example, I might look at the browser and see out of this filtered traffic what the browser distribution looked like. I don't see anything really interesting there. So maybe it has something to do with the particular device that's being used. And again, I'm not seeing anything horribly useful. But if I look at the server IP address, we'll see if there's something unique about the server. So here I see that almost all of the entries that are greater than 100 milliseconds are narrowed down to a single server. So right now, I think I can safely tell my application team that they need to look into this server and see if it maybe has some kind of a cron job entry where it's doing a backup or something else is going on on this server during a certain time frame. So we've reached that mean time to innocence. We figured out that this problem was caused by one of the servers. We know it's not the network. We've given the, the team actionable information. And I have to say, I've spent a lot of time with other load balancers trying to figure out these problems. And it's a real breath of fresh air to see how easy it is to do with the Avi load balancer. So now that I've shown you how quickly we can look at issues going on with a VIP, I want to talk about how easy it is to deploy a new service. So let's switch over to the marketing tenant and click on Create Virtual Service. And I'll just go with the basic setup. So here's where I pick which cloud I want to deploy in. Let's pick the VMware cloud and deploy it there. So I give this virtual service a name. Let's call it test VIP. And here I can put in the address of the VIP, but instead I'm going to auto allocate. So this is one of the great features. So I have IP address management integrated with my vCenter infrastructure. And so it knows based on which networks I'm deploying in, where, where to deploy the, uh, the VIP. So I'm going to choose the subnet. Now, if I were in AWS or Google Cloud, it would be picking that information from that cloud and give me a menu of options here in the GUI uh, that, that I can then choose from. Here I put in the application domain name. So this is integrated with my DNS infrastructure. So as soon as I deploy this, it gets updated into my DNS infrastructure and customers are able to access it right away. So here I can type in the individual servers for the pool, or I could click on select servers by network. So I want to put this in the correct network. So I'm going to put it in the 1079.1860 network. And here I want to search for any that match web. So these are all my Docker web servers. And I click on Add Servers. Click Save. And boom, I have my test VIP configured. So if we go and look at this in our virtual server tree, we can see that we have the test VIP. We have a test VIP pool. We can see that everything's passing the health checks and we're up and running. And it's as easy as that to deploy a virtual service. Notice that I didn't have to configure any load balancers for this VIP. My controller decides where I, where I have the capacity, where I have connectivity to the VIP network, and so on. I don't need to worry about that. The controller makes all of those decisions for me. Now, this is a demo environment, so we configured it to be placed on one service engine. In production, we probably want more. So 
So let's go back to the application services list here. And I click on the VIP. And now I click on scale out. So when I scale out, what's going on is I don't actually have a second service engine running in my ESX infrastructure. So my controller picked another ESXi host and it's in the process of deploying a new service engine load balancer on that host. If this were in a public cloud provider like AWS or Google Cloud or Azure, it would deploy a new service engine within that cloud provider infrastructure automatically. So we can see that it's creating the SE. Let's come back when it's done. So the controller has finished deploying the service engine to our ESX infrastructure. It copied the OVA file over. It added the VNEX that needed to be added. It configured the networking. All the stuff that takes a long time for us to do, even if we try and automate it with tools like Ansible, um, it's still a lot of work for us to develop those tools. This is all built in. Now you can use automated tools uh, like Ansible with the controller, but the controller makes it easy to deploy this in any kind of environment, whether that's public cloud or private cloud infrastructure. So aside from being easy to manage and troubleshoot and easy to deploy new applications, another thing that customers love about our product is the ability to do self-service. So this is a self-service portal we've created. And we're going to pick the data center. Let's pick uh, Sunnyvale. We'll pick marketing. And we'll call this shopping cart. And we can pick whether it uses HTTP or HTTPS. We'll choose the servers and hit submit. So this is showing you the API call that's actually getting done on the back end. This JSON object is part of a declarative model. So the, the whole definition for the virtual service is in this JSON object, and this is what the API call would look like. So now if I go back and I look, I can see that my shopping cart has been deployed. Let's look and see if it's healthy. Yes, so I can see that uh, my shopping cart looks good. Let's look at the tree. And I can see that it's, it's low balancing to those backend servers now. So we didn't have to have any awareness of what that backend infrastructure was as a customer. We simply pick the data center and we give the name and this all gets registered in DNS and automatically created by the controller. And we're up and running. Thanks for watching my demo. I hope you're as excited as I am about this product. And you can see that with the ability to make it easy to use, easy to deploy, and easy to create self-service portals in essentially any cloud infrastructure with full awareness of your cloud environment, that you're now prepared to have a true multi-cloud infrastructure that can scale on demand with the elasticity that your applications required. Thank you.